Hello there, a uh, very good day and welcome to Insight. This is a program dedicated to examine current issues taking place in Guyana. Today I'm joined on this edition by the Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Anil Nandalal. Minister, good day and welcome to the program. Thank you, um, Eddie, for inviting me to be part of your program and a good day to your listeners and viewers across Guyana. In today's edition, we are going to examine a number of issues like I highlighted. Uh, topping the list is that of the first sitting of the 12th Parliament, where members of Parliament took the oath of office. We had some developments inside the Parliament chambers. And of course, we're going to examine the elections petition filed by the APNU AFC opposition and some very uh, strong statements made by Mr. Joseph Harmon, who is the leader of the opposition. Again, Minister, welcome. And I want us to start with the sitting of the, the first sitting of the 12th Parliament. Um, members of Parliament took the oath of office. Um, the Parliament also examined some government business. Well, Eddie, as you know, we had a, a five-month hiatus where our country was put on trial, where democracy was put on trial, where forces from the opposition, AP and UAFC, in conspiracy with some persons at GCOM, attempted to steal the government. They attempted to steal tens of thousands of votes of the Guyanese electorate who voted at the last elections. They tried to destroy our democracy and destroy the democratic uh, achievements which we have made over the past two or three decades. Fortunately, Guyana as a country and Guyanese as a people stood together and consolidated their nationalism and patriotism. And with the help of the international community and our regional brothers and sisters right here in the Caribbean, we were able to repel those forces of destruction and our country survived. As soon as we got into the government, and the country was able to breathe a sigh of relief, we began to work. We discovered very quickly that the treasury was empty, that the productive sectors were dormant and are dormant, that business and commerce are at their all-time low, that the morale of the people are beaten and broken, and that the governmental infrastructure is rotting and has decayed over the past five years due to incompetence, abuse of power, squandermania, and nepotism and corruption. So in every ministry, you found rot you found basically nothing happened in five years. We knew from the opposition, we were seeing this from the outside, we were hearing about it, but when we entered into the government itself and we were able to examine the structures and the apparatus within the government, then we were able to uh, uh, realize and um, asserting the level of destruction which have taken place. The country has no money and all the extra budgetary funds in which we left billions of dollars were emptied. So we had to move quickly into activating the constitutional processes so as to kickstart government after that long and protracted delay. So bringing the parliament into motion so that we can get 
monies to be properly approved and a budget pass are requisite in this circumstance. And today, after great work over the past two weeks, we were able to get Parliament started, the 12th Parliament of Guyana. Of course, we didn't have the, the ceremony that normally comes with the opening of a section of yeah. Parliament, and we didn't have the President there to give his inaugural address to the Parliament. The President is um, in Barbies, dealing with some urgent matters there, but we had to kickstart the process somehow. We are operating under severe constraints as a result of the COVID pandemic, so that has compounded the issue. So you have um, no money, um, an economy that is, has become lazy, the productive sectors, and you have a, um, a serious health pandemic to deal with. In that circumstance, in those circumstances, it's not easy to operate. So within those constraints, we quickly got Parliament to sit, and today was the first sitting, and we began the business of Parliament. It starts with the uh, members taking the oath of office and the election of a Speaker of the National Assembly. Um, normally, the tradition and convention is that government members using their majority would elect a speaker of their choice. Today that was done, and Mr. Manzur Nadir, a very experienced politician, a seasoned parliamentarian, and a person who is well acquainted with democracy, constitutional workings, and the standing order, standing orders, was elected. And I want to use this platform to offer him my um, heartiest congratulations. After that was done, then the next task is the election of the deputy speaker. Now, historically, the government elects the speaker and leaves the deputy speaker to be elected by the opposition. And that has been the tradition in Guyana since independence. In 2015, the authoritarians, the authoritarian dictators that they are, the AP and new AFC having won an election for the first time, took both the speaker and the deputy speaker. Perhaps the first time that happening in, certainly the first time that happening in Guyana, but probably the first time that has happened in the Caribbean and possible, possibly the entire Commonwealth. So they took both the speaker and the deputy speaker in 2015. Um, not, not in 2015, sorry, in 2011. 2011. When they had a majority in 2015, we never took up the deputy speaker position. We left it. Um, today, we, the government side, supported an opposition member, Mr. Lennox Schumann, who is part of a combined opposition comprising of three political parties in an amalgam. And Schumann was chosen by that political consortium to be their representative. And we supported Schumann, and he was elected deputy speaker. AP and UAFC apparently were offended and they left the house. But before we, because I want us to talk a little bit about the, the walkout from Parliament and uh, the grounds on which that happened, but I want to go back to your comment about uh, Mr. Schumann. Is it a case where, when, when you said they, they were upset and so on, the APNU AFC, 
Is it a case where they don't see Mr. Schuman as part of the opposition? Because I know traditionally, um, you have the government side, and you have, even if it's four, five, three, how many parties, um, having seats on the opposition bench, then that person is considered to be a part of the opposition. Between 2050, uh, 2011 and 2015, when the AFC wasn't part of that um, coalition, they, they were on the opposition benches, and I think the, I think the, uh, the deputy speaker came, if, if I'm correct, or no, the speaker came from the AFC uh, in the person of Mr. Trotman. Now, you have to understand the mentality and ideology of dictators and authoritarians. They do not entertain others. They do not tolerate others. They are intolerant of any other person other than their, themselves. And that is why they can't participate in an elections. Because when they lose, that is what happens. They move into this mode of pandemonium, panic, and chaos. And that is what happened in the last election. It's the dictator mentality you're seeing at work. So they can't imagine that they are on the opposition benches, but are, cannot be the speaker, the deputy speaker. They are intolerant of another opposition force with them. Though when they were in the opposition, and had a one-seat majority, they took the speakership and the deputy speakership. They didn't see anything wrong then. The dictator only sees himself. He only caters for himself. He only thinks about himself. And that is what you saw playing out there. Though Schumann is there and is part of the opposition, they can't fathom that. They can't fathom that they have lost the election. <laughs> Because Harmon keeps saying that we have won the elections by fraud. The most hilarious and ridiculous statement at the same time. But we will deal with that at a later stage. So they walked out because, you know, like a spoiled child. They didn't get it, so they walk out. They didn't win the elections, so they wanted to break up the country. That is their mentality. And that has always been their mentality. So let's move on. So they walked out. And we presented the uh, Constitutional Agency's budget. As I said, we have had a hiatus of over five months. The country is off a constitutional track in terms of the time for presentation of a budget. The financial year of Guyana begins on the 1st of January and ends on the 31st of December. The Constitution provides for a budget to be presented within 90 days of the first day of January. We are well beyond eight months. We are now in the ninth month and we don't have a budget. So, we are way out of time. We are in violation of every time frame contemplated by the law and provided for in the Constitution. So we have to get the work going. So we can't bother with the infantile and immature behavior of those who walked out and were throwing a tantrum somewhere outside of the chambers. We went, went on to do the people's business which was to pass the agency's budget for the constitutional agencies. So we completed that process, and Parliament or the National Assembly um, approved approximately $12 billion of monies to be spent from now to December in relation to the um, constitutional agencies. You know, under the law, those agencies' budget are dealt with separately yeah. from the rest of the country's national budget. So we completed the first component of the budgetary process, and we are happy to report that to the country 
So you have the important constitutional agencies, for example, are the judiciary, the DPP, the, um, all the rights commission, the parliament's office, the police service commission, the judicial service commission, all those important uh, constitutional agencies. Their budgets were um, passed today, so they are out of the way. We now have to meet again to deal with the other budgetary um, agencies and their budget. That we will do at the earliest convenient time. I want to I want to go back to the walkout uh, briefly, though, Minister, and I want to talk about statements uh, that, that were made by people like uh, Harmon, uh, Christopher Jones, and the others um, who are saying they are going to be in Parliament to give the PVP a hard time. They are going to be uh, holding the, the the feet of the PVP over the fire. But the first opportunity that they had to sit there to scrutinize um, the budget of the constitutional agencies, um, they walked out. Is it? Is this their way of, 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 of giving the PVP a hard time? These persons are among the most incompetent bunch of people you will meet anywhere on planet Earth. And I say so with the greatest of respect. And the world would have seen that. Guyana would have seen that. And the electorate, at the first opportunity it got, threw them out. They lost, recall, they lost the 2016 local government elections. They lost the 2018 local government elections. And they lost the 2020 national and regional elections. So after the population realized very quickly between 2015 and 2016 that they made a mistake in electing this bunch immediately after they realized that they made a mistake. In 2016, they voted them out of the local government. 2018, voted them again. And 2020, threw them out completely. Nothing has changed. And worse yet, they confirm the fear of everyone by their behavior from March 3rd to August 2nd. So in addition to the bumbling incompetence, their corruption, their mismanagement, their squandimania, their abuse of power, their lack of, their lack of respect for the Constitution. The world saw how dishonest they can be, how intolerant they can be to democracy, how far they can go, and they are prepared to go to steal a government. So, this dishonest bunch, unfortunately, will not be able to represent an opposition's interest, in my view, against our government. We welcome robust scrutiny. We welcome a formidable challenge. We welcome a competent opposition. That is not present in this bunch. And today was a remarkable demonstration of that. They could have come into that chamber and posed questions in relation to the monetary allocations for the constitutional agencies. They could have come there and asked for more and demonstrate why these constitutional agencies should get more. Instead, they took their oath of office, full up their forms to see that they are MPs, to ensure that they get their salary at the end of the month, and they walked out. And they start to perform outside on a stage of their own. And that is what will happen. If they are inside, they will be ineffective. So they have to go outside and create their own freak show and side show. And you will see this is a precedent, and it will continue. And I hear Mr. Harmon. This guy, the more he speaks, the more people will lose respect for him. But we will come to him just now, um, Minister, because I want us to address a couple of things that he would have mentioned um, 
yesterday, but I want to first deal with the elections petition that was filed. Interestingly, in what was filed, the statements of polls from March 2nd are missing from the opposition's bundle, so to speak, that was filed. Um, your general thoughts on the petition and addressing that particular issue. First of all, it took five months of banging on their heads every day, night and day, by the local community, by the international community, by the regional community, by the High Court, by the Court of Appeal, and by the Caribbean Court of Justice before they understand that it is an election petition that they have to file. So they took five months of trashing to understand that. And we are happy and we breathe a sigh of relief that eventually they understood that. That you want to challenge an election, that is where you go. Now, I have not had a chance to examine the petition, but I have read excerpts of it being quoted in the press. And if the press has quoted excerpts accurately, and that is what they base their, their petition on, the same ridiculous, outrageous, unsubstantiated, contentions and accusations that they were making at the convention center, then that petition has no likelihood of success. It is destined to fail. That is the first point I want to make. Because from all indications, it is simply a compendium of that ridiculous bundle of allegations which they made at the convention center, which people by themselves came out and proven wrong by simply appearing in the press. Remember, according to them, they killed tens of thousands of people in their allegations that all these people are dead. And people from right across the country came out and said, hey, I'm here. I voted. <laughs> I'm not dead. I'm not in Brooklyn. I'm not in Queens. I'm in Richmond Hill, but it's as a cribble. <laughs> so, so, so if that is the basis of their um, allegations, or the, the, the petition, then it is bound to fail. There's no doubt about that. But any in law and in litigation, like everything else, your credibility matters. Your bona fides matter. You go to a place of justice for justice. You have to, you are appearing before a judge, a human being. You are coming there to Lady Justice the epitome of purity, and you are asking for justice. If you are doing that, a large part of winning the court is at least persuading the court that you are sincere, that you have a real just cause, that you are, your, you are, your case is based upon good faith that you have a genuine wrong that you have suffered. If, and, and you have to create that mentality, that, that impression. To do so, you can't approach the court with unclean hands. You can't approach the court and withhold material information. You are enjoined to make a full and frank disclosure of all the facts, even those that are against you. And that is how you win a court over, without even uttering a word. Now, the basis of any election 
is the statements of Paul. You are going to a court to tell a judge or to ask a judge to set aside a whole election, put a government out of office, set aside that political party's results as fraudulent, and you are not putting forward your results. You are not putting forward your case. So you want this judge to throw this government out, set aside all these results that this, this party claimed that they got and the election commission declared, but you are not showing why, what is your evidence that you have, and you want to go in there as the next government, and you are not showing your qualification, you are not putting your case out, so the case lacks moral underpinning. It lacks a moral foundation. And Eddie, all that which they have been avoiding and that which their agents are hiding at GCOM, all will come out now in the court. And for that reason, I am very happy that they are now in a court where orders will be made. One of them will have to be an order for them to produce their statements of poll. And an order for GCOM to produce the statements of poll. So the dance will, done, will end right here now. So I am happy. I am happy that they have brought the petition because they give us another opportunity to get certain members of staff of GCOM in a witness box and get some of their own members so that Valda Lawrence, for example, can come and tell us on the oath, on the cross-examination, how her signature is on a declaration made by Mingo. All of that information, how that spreadsheet from whence did it come that Mingo used as the basis of his declaration? And it is their own case that will create that platform. So I am happy, having said what I said, I am happy that the matter is now in the court. That is where we wanted it all the time, but by the proper process. Uh, Minister, um, <clears throat> following the, the petition presented to the court, you had uh, Mr. Harmon making some statements, and I just want to put this into context. Um, and some of those statements are inciting, uh, very, very much inciting. And to put us in the context of what we have come to, to, to know of the PNC, and we can go back to 1992, we can go back to 1997 when you had the more fire, slow fire campaign, we can go back to the 2001 elections. Um, where there's always incitement on the part of the PNC trying to stir up problems and so forth. But some of the things that uh, Mr. Harmon said, and I would want you to deal with the whole inciting separately from the other issues that we have here, but you have allegations of the PPP squander mania, uh, talks about the PPP has an oversized government, um, talking about, uh, it, and, and I addressed this earlier, talking about it's not business as usual, but we saw them walking out on the very first day, the very first sitting of the 12th Parliament. Maybe uh, you can, you can um, address those first, and then you address the issue of them inciting, because one of the things Mr. Hammond said in his statement is to say that the PVP has its knees on the necks of people in Belladrum, in Buxton, in South Georgetown, and the communities that he identified are of um, a specific demographic. Um, so a lot of inciting, he talked about ac accusations basically of the PPP, um, and this was one that they have been running for a very long time, of the PPP killing, uh, murdering uh, young afro Guyanese. So you can address that separately from the other issues of oversized government and Squandermania and so forth. So let's start in the order that you have recited. Now, I was going to make the point, and you stopped me, and let me make it now. 
that for a few months now, I am of the firm opinion, and I'm sure that I am not in a minority, that something is seriously wrong with Mr. Harmon. He made those statements, all of which are outrageous, a whole host of them during the five months period. Then when we got into government and his contract was terminated, he expressed utter shock and indicated an intention and an expectation that he would have continued to work at the office of the president. And then he issued that statement to the international community, telling them that the PPP has rigged the election. This is the international community that have stood by for five months and witnessed firsthand Harman and his rigging cabal trying everything on planet Earth to steal the government and rig the elections. The very international community that pleaded with them over and over that don't do this. And the same international community that Harman said, you are interfering with our sovereignty. You are interfering with domestic politics. You want to recolonize us. You are racist. You are disrespectful. These were the terms that Mr. Harmon used to cuss out all the international agencies. Look at what he said about Prime Minister um, Ralph Gonzalez. He's out of place. And the man called him some kitchen utensil. <laughs> But <laughs> Mr. Harmon is living in a bubble somewhere that is far removed from reality. So you, here he goes again. Let us take the allegation of squandimania. We don't have a budget. We can't pay a salary. I just said that we had to rush to the parliament so that we can get money out of the treasury. All the agencies that were available to us outside of a parliamentary process, they have spent the money out. And this guy are accusing us, is accusing us of squandermania. We don't even have the money to squander, even if we want to squander. So that's the first ridiculous, outrageous statement he has made. Then he accused us of an oversized government? We have 17 ministries. They just come out of government and they had 28. 10 more, 11 more than us. I don't understand this guy. And then you had 28 ministries and a whole host of ministers within a ministry. They took departments and made them into ministries. For example, the Ministry of, of um, Citizenship. That's the department now in the Ministry of Home Affairs with one minister. They had Kemrad Ramjetan and Felix dividing the ministry in two. So you have one set of staff of Ramjetan one set of staff and secretariat for, for Felix, driver, bodyguard, house, for telephone, all the things that the minister get, multiply by two, and he runs the department. Then you had about three ministers of, of indigenous affairs, Hastings, Garrido Law, and Mr. Ali Cock. Ali Cock. You had four vice presidents. A lot of ministers in the Ministry of the Presidency. You have about five ministries within the Ministry of the President. You had a Prime Minister that who just, he was just a Prime Minister. <laughs> but he was a Prime Minister. But he did nothing. And this guy talking about uh, oversized government, that is why I'm telling you something is fundamentally wrong with Mr. Harmon. And the more he speaks, 
the more the public will realize the truism of what I'm saying. What, what else he talk, spoke about? Well, he spoke as well about um, the whole issue of it will not be business as usual, and he went back to his statement of fraudulent government and, and, and so forth. Look at that. Another outrageous statement. The, the entire world saw, I mean, I don't want to rehash it, and Harmon wants to speak about that our government is fraudulent. And, and I heard him speak about incompetence. This guy, the entire population, after five years, the population, for every opportunity that they got, they voted against them. Voted against them to get them out of the way. And he is speaking about incompetence, and this guy is speaking about democracy and about fraudulent elections. Let him say, the more he says that, it's better for us. I want him to repeat that statement more and more. I am sure the whole Caribbean is listening to him and everybody's looking at him in absolute amazement. I, I want us to address now, Minister, and I mentioned these before, these uh, inciting statements. And, and this is, this is well, not an isolation, uh, now, though. No, Eddie, it is no, nothing new. This is nothing new. In government, they abysmally fail to deliver their campaign promises. They fail the ordinary Guyanese, including the PNC, APNU, AFC supporter. They fail them abysmally. Those very small Guyanese, the ordinary grassroots Guyanese, saw how the chosen few at the top were given the contracts. The Brian Tiwaris and the BK International and all the other cronies and close friends of Harmon who got the contracts and got enjoyed the gravy trade. And that is why, and the total incompetence for five years of this government, of their government, that caused them the elections. And then after the elect, and then of course, during that five years, they began that to wage war against the constitution of the country, against the judicial system. They lost a no-confidence motion and remained in office illegally. So after that kind of performance in government, the people voted them out. And the sensible few that supported them for that after the elections would have also distanced themselves from them because of what they did and how they embarrassed themselves on a universal and global platform as they attempted to thwart the will of the people, steal the electorate votes, and rig the elections. And now they have nothing else left to play in the park. There's no other card left to play in the park. So they only mobilize, they can mobilize now on, on, on performance. They can mobilize on delivery of promises. They can not mobilize on the platform of democracy. They can not mobilize on the platform of constitutional good governance. They can't mobilize on those platforms because they have abysmally failed. So the only thing left is the basal card, the bestial card of race. And that is what he's mobilizing on, race, appealing to the basal instincts of people, creating this story in his head. So he brings this American concept of knee on your neck to incite people here. Use Mingo, a man who was clearly implicated in fraud and who is subject to investigation and who is being held by the police in accordance with law, <clears throat> using that 
as a platform, making a connection between Mingo's race and his agenda. <clears throat> and do not discount also that they are afraid that Mingo may speak the truth. Or perhaps he did, I don't know. The police will have that information. <clears throat> so it's desperation. But that racial argument has never won. And it will not win. The truth of the matter is, he was one of the most powerful men in the government. Why did he not hold the commission of inquiry? To find out who killed how many thousand people as they are alleging. They were in the government. They hold a commission of inquiry over two car crash on East Bank of Demerara. They hold a commission of inquiry into that. They hold a commission of inquiry because somebody called, allegedly called Mr. Granger on a cell phone and say they will harm him. They hold a commission of inquiry into that. So thousands of afro Guyanese were murdered according to them. They are so concerned about it. They are so affected by it. But when you were in government, what did you do about it? Now you are on the opposition, you're gone with the propaganda again. Who is going to believe that? So these people are incompetent. Their rhetoric do not make sense. Their propaganda is cheap and inferior. And that is why they have to revert to things like the race car to mobilize. But the Guyana, the Guyana population, Eddie, we have evolved as a people. During this five months period, and even during the five year period, there were many attempts that were made by them to mobilize on the ground of race, to incite, to cause disruptions. And they did not succeed. And they will not succeed because the ordinary Guyanese from every walk of life will, will see improvements in their everyday life as the PPP settles in into government. As we have done to the population and to the lives of this, the people of this country since 1992. And once we get, just let us get the budget out of the way, then you will see even that card that they are trying to use to mobilize will disappear from them as well. But it has been ineffective and it will continue to be so. Minister, I want to thank you very much for joining me today uh, to discuss these very important topical issues on this edition of Insight. Um, it was a pleasure to have you here and to our viewers, we want to say thanks for being part of this program. Thank you very much, Eddie.